Now, Mr. Speaker, we all know that divorce is often a painful experience for couples, and particularly so when children are involved. In an ideal world, parents would see past their differences and apply what the courts currently apply, that is to say, the best interests of the child standard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to rise today to speak to this private uh, member's bill, a very nonpartisan bill, uh, one whose time has come in this country uh, for the sake of families and for the benefit of children. Uh, throughout my time as a member of parliament, uh, next year my 19th year, I have fought for legislation and public policy that has recognized and protected the role of the family as the basic uh, foundational unit of society. I think that's pretty important, and I think we uh, pay a price uh, when we do not uh, support it and uh, try, to, try to deal with some of the uh, fallout that happens occasionally and try to mitigate that as well in respect to family. And so with Bill C-560, I'm continuing my commitment to stand up for the Canadian family by seeking an amendment uh, to our Divorce Act. And these amendments will keep uh, both parents in the lives of uh, more children in those cases where marriage does break down in families that have children. These amendments in uh, C-560 uh, would direct the courts in regard to divorce to make equal shared parenting, and we'll talk of that later in terms of the, the range being 35 to 50 percent there roughly, uh, but making that the presumptive arrangement in the best interest of the child, except in cases of uh, proven, proven cases of abuse or neglect. I introduced a similar bill, C-422, in June 2009, but it was never uh, debated due to an election call. And previous to that, in the year 2008, I introduced a motion, M483, expressing support for the principle of equal shared parenting. And at that time, the government of the Northwest Territories expressed their solidarity with that position uh, by way of a motion that they passed in their legislature. Seventeen long years ago, in 1997, just prior to my having stepped onto the federal scene here, a joint House-Senate committee presented to Parliament a report entitled, For the Sake of the Children. And that report urged Parliament to amend the Divorce Act to make equal shared parenting the normative determination by courts dealing with situations, situations of divorce involving children. And that nonpartisan recommendation from that joint House-Senate report was based on some pretty compelling research. You can read that uh, extensive testimony. It was made available to all those committee members of the different parties, and they came up with this uh, consensus report between the House and the uh, Senate called for the sake of the children. So Bill C-560 is a very modest attempt to address some of the concerns and recommendations made in that report. And in particular, the rebuttable presumption takes children out of the equation as pawns in the battle for gain by adversarial parents. So it's taking, removing children so that this war, once there's breakdown of marriage, some are more uh, adversarial situations than others, but removing children from that equation so you can fight over the house and the boat and the land and whatever other kinds of uh, assets you, you've had in that uh, marriage, uh, but not the children. We'll set some guidelines, we'll have some restrictions, we'll uh, not make it about the children. Uh, it requires parents to cooperate towards equal shared parenting unless they can make a credible, compelling case that this would not be in the best interest of their children. Uh, in this respect, uh, Bill C-560 is catching up to the best social science research which demonstrates the importance of a child's continued access to both parents, a father and a mother, and the uh, best personal and social outcomes. There are exceptions to this ordinary reality, which is why the presumption is rebuttable. I think lawyers in this House would understand what that means, and uh, why there are exceptions for a proven neglect and abuse. And this is not just allegations of abuse or allegations of this, that, or the other, but this is actually proven evidentiary, uh, proven neglect and abuse. Bill C-560 also replaces the language of custody and access with the language of parents, and it uses terms such as parenting order and equal parenting. Uh, recommendation 5 from the Sake of the Children report reads as follows. This committee recommends that the terms custody and access no longer be used in the Divorce Act, and instead that the, term, the, that the meaning of both terms be incorporated and received in the new term shared parenting, which shall be taken to include all the meanings, rights, obligations, and common law and statutory interpretations embodied previously in the terms custody and access. The International Organization Leading Women for Shared Parenting reports that 
Research also proves that although children want a relationship with both their parents, regardless of marital status, healthy bonding with a parent is impossible without a substantial amount of time spent in that parent's physical presence. And that means very close to equal, end of quote. Uh, this bill does not actually establish a firm figure for what that equal time looks like, but in jurisdictions across the world, from those that would be more socialist countries, uh, Sweden, Belgium, and so on, to more to the right of things, I suppose Australia, some U.S. states, uh, but that range has been uh, determined to be 35 to 50 percent of residential time with each parent. Uh, that's considered to be consistent with the uh, notion as it is in the courts thus far. Uh, lawyers for Shared Parenting notes that Bill 560 uh, conforms with the principles of children's rights as advanced by the United Nation, uh, United Nation Convention on the Rights of the Child, which has been ratified by Canada. We're a signatory to that convention. Article 9 of that UN Convention of the Rights of the Child argues for a child's prior right of access to both parents, thereby thereby establishing a presumption for equal shared parenting in cases of divorce and separation. Some people have objected to uh, establishing a presumption in law regarding child custody cases, but the reality is that a presumption already exists de facto in the system because upwards of 80% of custody cases are decided for sole custody. So in effect, we do have a presumption, a presumption in favor of sole custody as things presently stand. What Bill C-560 does is to bring Canadian law into the 21st century by bringing it up to date with the best social science research, which indicates that a child's continued access to both parents following divorce or separation is the typical child's best interest. And I think it's important to, uh, to define what this best interest is. Uh, so often across the country, we use the term, uh, the amorphous, uh, vague kind of term, the best interest of the child. You might even heard it uh, uh, speechified today around the house, uh, but certainly people will say, well, we, we don't know if we want this bill to come into place because we are for the best interest of the child, which is an amorphous, uh, vague, uh, moldable as putty in the hands of lawmakers and social workers and so on, and it doesn't really get at what, what that really is in a factual way. Whereas now we know from social science research that the best interests of children is to have continued access to both parents following divorce or separation that's in their best interest. So that's the loading in understanding from a social science basis what that term actually should mean. Others have represented this bill by claiming that it eliminates judicial discretion. And uh, I'm not a lawyer, and of course I would not want to offend my legal colleagues, so we're not eliminating all uh, judicial discretion on these custodial matters. This bill does not eliminate all judicial discretion, so there can still be a consideration of uh, each family situation that comes before the courts, but what this bill does is tighten up the language surrounding judicial discretion so that it becomes more difficult to use an antiquated interpretation of the best interest of the child as an excuse to rationalize a disproportionate percentage of sole custody decisions in today's family courts. Suggestions that a uh, rebuttable presumption is too onerous a standard uh, is also brought by some people, uh, but that uh, particular accusation is uh, really inconsistent with multiple constitutional rulings in many countries, including Canada, where those rulings have made judgment, have made rulings that parents are presumed to act in the best interest of their children unless shown otherwise. Uh, if one wants to uh, say that rebuttable presumption is too onerous, uh, then really uh, one is almost arguing for the revocation of the basic legal doctrine that one is presumptively innocent unless proven otherwise. That's a basic tenet of our courts, of our judicial system, that one is innocent until, until proven otherwise, presumptively innocent, and so in respect to parents, the same thing. Unless you can prove that a person is not a fit parent, we are not uh, wise to make those kind of assumptions. Some have argued that a presumption of equal shared parenting will increase conflict in already acrimonious family situations. In fact, it's the adversarial family court system that fuels such conflict and disenfranchisement of parents uh, that is really the most harmful to, to children. Uh, pitting parents against one another in bitter court battles that frequently results in a winning and losing parent. Uh, do we really de desire that kind of a system where we litigate over children? Do we desire a system where the courts remove fit parents from their own children's lives? So the negative impact of this current system as well on children, mostly and 
foremost, as well as on their parents and extended family is really quite unconscionable and immoral. Bill C-560 should reduce conflict because it takes children out of the equation as objects of possession to be fought over by parents. Uh, with a presumption of equal shared parenting, access to the children cannot continue to be a part of the divorce negotiations and treated like a portion of the winnings or losses of divorce agreements. Parents will know that barring cases of proven abuse or neglect, the courts will for enforce an equi equitable access arrangement between both parents. Parents will be free to surrender some access if that works better for their personal circumstances and their children. Uh, but the presumption will create a disincentive for hostile parents to try to keep access to the children from the other parent. So somebody's a long haul trucker and he says, for me, you know, we've got the presumption of uh, equal shared parenting, but it only works for me to have the kids about 30% of the time. Uh, and she's 70%. Or if the wife says I'm a, a physician with a very uh, time-filled, uh, pressure life, and I can only handle the children 35% of the time at my location, my presence, uh, then, then they would make that kind of an arrangement. So this doesn't impose on people to say that it has to be right 50%. It can be arranged. It can be anywhere from 35 uh, to 50%. A presumption of equal parenting would be expected as well to reduce uh, divorce rates. Uh, this has proven to be the case uh, as far back as 1998. Uh, researchers have uh, uh, postulated that uh, because when you go into a situation uh, without the presumption that you're going to get it all, then sometimes you back away a bit and you begin to work at those marriage difficulties. And so people like Mark, Margaret F. Brinig, uh, Frank Buckley, Dr. Sanford Braver, uh, various publications such as the International Review of Law and Economics, American Law and Economics Review, uh, have found that there's a preemptive and preventive uh, factor in this whole issue of, uh, in the whole concept of equal shared parenting. I think colleagues in this house are well aware of the social costs uh, surrounding uh, deviant behavior among youth, whether in terms of the justice system or the welfare system, and an important way to reduce those costs and logistical challenges related to policing and the courts and social welfare program delivery. Uh, social worker caseloads and more is to strengthen the families in our communities, uh, including children's access to both the father and mother, even in cases of separation and divorce. Uh, children in sole custody settings are reported as having notably higher, in fact, about three times higher. It's kind of jarring, but I'm just stating the facts here. Uh, three times higher likelihoods of suffering from, self, from low self-esteem, insecurity and rejection, uh, being underachievers, including school dropouts, substance abuse, depression, suicide, teen pregnancy, and even crime. Eighty percent of criminals are from single parent homes. Uh, I need to quickly qualify as well to say my hat's off to single parents who, uh, who I've known from in this house and elsewhere, from my riding, as we all do, uh, that do a 24-7 kind of job and do a remarkable yeoman's job, but it's not an easy job. And uh, the reality is, and the stats are simply that 80% of individuals in trouble with the law are from single parent home situations. In most cases of sole custody, when the custody is granted to one or the other, maybe more typically to the mother, uh, where the father is shut out, uh, father, fatherlessness in particular has been isolated as a serious indicator for poor outcomes among children. So we have big brothers, we have other substitutes uh, for that very reason. Uh, so I can list the uh, host of problems, uh, anxieties, uh, learning disabilities, truancy, runaway, drug, uh, drug abuse, teenage, presence, uh, teenage pregnancy, mental illness, and suicide. Uh, those are all some of the things in a long list or litany uh, when fathers are removed from homes unnecessarily. So equal shared parenting is an important way to combat those risks among the growing segment of children who live in homes that have experienced divorce. There's a lot of good research out there. Uh, I just drop a few names at this point. A Dr. Edward Cruck, a professor at the University of British Columbia. Uh, a new study by Richard A. Warshak, W-A-R-S-H-A-K, uh, at the University of Texas Southern, Southwestern Medical Center. Uh, D.A. Smith and G.R. Jarjuras have an article on social structure and criminal victimization. Uh, we have just a long list of many others that have done extensive research on the benefits of equal shared parenting. You can certainly contact me later about those. They're also on uh, my website for you to look at. We have uh, countries in Europe, as in France and Sweden, Netherlands, Belgium, Denmark, Italy, and Luxembourg have adopted shared parenting. A number of U.S. states have as well. We find as well across our country that about 80 percent 
uh, those who claim to be NDP supporters. 80% in that range, uh, those who are Liberal supporters, uh, support this concept of equal shared parenting. 80% for Conservatives. Uh, more women, above 80% again, of women than men support equal shared parenting. All across the country, the highest support in Quebec and uh, the Atlantic provinces, above 80% as well. So I just close uh, by thanking my colleague from uh, the Liberal Party, Raymond Folco, who was the seconder on my bill, C-422, uh, an avowed a staunch feminist who actually supported, stood with me as we launched that first bill. And I think it's one that all colleagues in this House, respective of gender, part of the country, part of the provinces that you are, that you would support this uh, for the benefit of children. And I thank you. I appreciate the work that he has put in and his persistence because it's not the first version of C-560. It was also in the previous parliament under another number and um, it uh, caused a lot of uh, stories to be written about it. I uh, was elected in May 2011 and it's probably one, not, not the only one, but uh, one about which I received the most uh, feedback from my voters. So first of all, I'd like to thank all of those who wrote to me, whether it was through pe uh, people in my riding who had an interest in the issue. And I think, in fact, we all do. Because what's happening with our children is something that concerns everyone in this house to give uh, our children the best environment possible. So I have no doubt about that. And I felt that from uh, both sides, from those who supported C-560 and those who had real reservations about it. And so I've also had the benefit of hearing from many groups on both sides of the argument as well. I had a fascinating discussion with, uh, with Brian Ludmer, who is one of uh, the people, uh, or one of the creators, if I could put it that way, of this bill in uh, its terminology. And what fascinates me with the debate on C-560, Mr. Speaker, is uh, mostly the way people are saying almost the same thing. But it's when we decide on the solution and what is to be done that uh, the arguments start to diverge. So what flows from the analysis of C-560 for me, and I'll never claim to be a specialist in matrimonial law, that's why I took so much time before giving the NDP the, my recommendation because I had to speak to people who were far more specialized than me in this domain. Uh, I wanted to speak to people from the Canadian Bar Association and the Quebec Bar Association, for example, because uh, I would already hear, can already hear uh, the arguments coming from people who support the bill that lawyers want to uh, protect their own interests here. but. There are complex issues that uh, they have seen, I've seen them deal with over the years. Uh, and with C-560, C-422 before, deal with a lot of cases across the country that are quite dramatic, in Quebec as well, where you think, my goodness, what planet are we living on to hear the stories? But it's not because a bill in its implementation because some judges apply it one way or versus another it means that it doesn't mean that we should put it through the shredder and throw it away and change the system completely now some of uh, the bills who uh, the conservatives rather who support C560 they have to realize that it is a huge change it's not as simple as the impression they are giving us here what's being done here is at the very heart of what we call access and custody. It's the custody of children in Canada. This is the very basis of the whole act. And what this bill is doing is creating a presumption. So when you create a presumption, uh, Mr. Speaker, and even if it's retrograde, if it can be set aside, that presumption, uh, it is something that is completely different from beginning with the premise of the best interest of the child. So what's interesting looking at the bill is to go to the text that talks about presumption. And it says, and I'll, I'll have to go and look 
for it here, but the presumptions in paragraph 4 are refuted if it is decided that the interest of the child would be considerably better served by a shared custody and parenting of the child. So not only are you changing the primordial uh, aspect of the interest of the child, but then you're adding other aspects to it. So this presumption, the imposition of this presumption is a major problem with this bill. The retroactivity, I asked my colleague a question about that earlier. Why uh, did he decide to do that? He could very well have tabled this bill without undoing everything that's been done in the past, without saying that uh, the liberal, I mean, as my liberal colleague rather was saying, it could be dramatic to put all of these cases, tons of them, before the courts, and you'd be undoing arrangements that people had learned to live with. Perhaps at the time it wasn't the best solution, but one fact is clear, it would reopen the possibilities, and you know, Mr. Speaker, Uh, provisions that are retroactive in law are quite dangerous. The conservative uh, government saw that with the Whalen decision last week, and it's always kind of a red light to me. What I asked myself, because I tried to do this, very often the NDP caucus supports bills at second reading so that an in-depth analysis can be done at committee. But the problem here is that the major change that would be made, that is to say, to withdraw that pr presumption, because I, I, my colleague's right, there are major problems that we have to address, but not through a private member's bill. It has to be through a government bill to ensure that we better set the parameters out for judges and the way in which just justices have for granting custody with that equal access in mind. So I think everyone agrees on that. In Quebec, we have civil law, and we make sure that parental responsibilities are exercised by both parents. We hope that that's where we can get to in such cases. In my opinion, we can do this in uh, cases where, uh, or rather, I support bills a second reading if they are amendable. And if that is not the case, then I can't support them. I think we will listen to the various experts, and we know there have been reports on bills such as 422, so that we can get as close as possible to what the member wants to do, but keep in mind and work from the principles that have to be respected when we talk about custody of children. Where things sometimes get difficult is, and regardless of whether it is the mother or the father who is concerned, uh, sometimes there are things that happen over the years. Perhaps someone is not willing at the age of one or two to have equal parenting time, but maybe at the age of four, five, or six that could happen. So we need to have more flexibility when it comes to this equal parenting. I think it would have been a lot better idea to throw the baby out with the bathwater in this case. Uh, rather, I think this is what he is trying to do because he's not saying directly that the interest of the child should not be the priority. But what I hear and what we have in the way of terminology in the bill shows that there is going to be a presumption of equal parenting, and that will put even more of a burden on the courts to really take into account the, the interests of the child. So I think that the way this bill is drafted, with all due respect to the drafters, 
is such a drastic draconian change to what we should see in this kind of legislation is that we should agree that we need to make changes to the custody and access system, but we need to keep in mind the interest of the child. We need to look at how to provide better access to the parents, and that way we will be able to help parents and serve society. But I think, unfortunately, this bill should not even pass as second reading. But maybe we could sit down and see what we could do to take into account people's needs. Judges may just not be up to speed. Maybe they're not really in tune with what people's needs are in 2014, and to, they need to look more closely at that. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the bill placed before the House in his name, uh, C-560, is an effort to change the standard applied by the courts when dealing with divorce cases. Specifically, the summary contained in the bill reads as follows. This enactment amends the Divorce Act to replace the concept of custody orders with that of parenting orders. It instructs judges when making a parenting order to apply the principle of equal parenting unless it is established that the best interests of the child would be substantially enhanced by allocating parental responsibility other than equally. Mr. Speaker, as you've already heard, this is not the first time that the member has introduced a bill on this matter. The most significant changes that the bill would bring to the Divorce Act are, first, the removal of the current definition of custody from the Divorce Act, replacing it with parenting, uh, and that is defined as the act of assuming the role of a parent to a child, including custody, and all of the rights and responsibilities commonly and historically associated with the role of a parent. Second, the creation of a presumption that allocating parenting time equally between the spouses is in the best interest of the child, and that equal parental responsibility is in the best interest of the child. And third, the addition of factors that courts must consider in making custody orders. The current law mandates the application of the best interest of the child test. The best interest of the child test has been a fundamental part of most legislation relating to children for years. This doctrine is not unique to family law proceedings. It is also used in federal legislation under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, under the Citizenship Act, and under the Youth Criminal Justice Act. It's also used in some provincial legislation dealing with matters such as custody, access, and child support for unmarried couples, child protection legislation, and by that I mean legislation dealing with the apprehension and supervision of children by child protective services, adoption legislation, and even in some provincial change of name legislation. None of the federal acts define best interest of the child, as was pointed out by the member. However, many provincial family law and child protection acts include extensive definitions of the concept. Some provincial acts even include different best interest of the child tests for different contexts. For, interest, uh, for example, the Ontario Child and Family Services Act defines the test differently for child protection than it does for adoption. As it stands now, courts must apply the best interest of the child from the perspective of the child, not the parents. And they must consider the long-term interests of a child as well as the child's day-to-day -day needs. Three primary considerations under the best interests of the child that the courts often consider are preserving the status quo in the interest of maintaining some stability for the child, whether one parent acted as the primary caregiver during the relationship, and third, the importance of keeping siblings together when considering future housing arrangements. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the best interest of the child is a critical component of the Divorce Act, and it appears in sections relating to custody. Under the current Act, the best interest of the child, as they relate to condition, means, needs, and other circumstances of the child are the overriding factor the courts may consider when making a custody order.
Further, when making a custody order, courts must give effect to the principle that a child should have as much contact with each spouse as is consistent with the best interest of the child, and for that purpose shall take into consideration the willingness of the person for whom custody is sought to facilitate such contact. Now, Mr. Speaker, we all know that divorce is often a painful experience for couples, and particularly so when children are involved. In an ideal world, parents would see past their differences and apply what the courts currently apply, that is to say, the best interest of the child standard. However, since divorce is sometimes acrimonious, painful, and filled with emotion, the best interest of the child is sometimes lost or confused with the subjective interest of a parent, and often those competing interests are to the detriment of the child or children. It is for that reason, in part, that a judge must have the ability to apply his discretion, to ascertain the facts, and to eventually make a determination of what is in the best interest of the child. I fear that the Honourable Member is what the Honourable Member is proposing would seriously alter that standard and remove the discretion of the judge to assess the case through the best interest of the child and not the father or mother. And I am not alone in my concern about this bill. The Canadian Bar Association has serious, very serious concerns with this bill, Mr. Speaker. This is what the CBA had to say about the bill when it was introduced in a previous parliament as number C422, now C560. Quoting now from the Canadian Bar Association. As lawyers, we assist all family members in restructuring their responsibilities and arrangements of following separation and divorce. As a result, the Canadian Bar Association section sees this issue from all sides. We firmly believe that the only perspective to foster outcomes that are best for children is to, re is to require that the courts and parents focus solely on the children's interests in making decisions. Bill C-422, now C-560, does not accomplish what it proposes. It does not give the parties tools to resolve differences, nor does it assist them in making plans to share decision-making and physical care of children to minimize conflict and maximize children's benefits. It would move from considering the individual child to preferring parents' rights. It would encourage contentious litigation in future cases of family breakdown, and equally important, would cause thousands of children to be re-exposed to litigation and conflict as many settled cases would be reopened. The words of the Canadian Bar Association, not mine. Under the current law, the legal playing field is even. There is no gender bias in law requiring judges to consider the best interests of the child as paramount. Instead, the bill pr proposes an overly simplistic idea of equality. Rather than considering a fair result, best for the children involved in the case at hand, children must be split right down the middle. The bill does not advance equality for either fathers or mothers. Its proposals would come at the sacrifice of the appropriate focus solely on what is best for the children. That's from the Canadian Bar Association, Mr. Speaker. But there is more in the way of opposition to this bill, Mr. Speaker, and it comes from the member's own party. Senior ministers have come out against this effort. In 2009, speaking to the Canadian Bar Association's annual conference, then Minister of Justice and Attorney General, now Defence Minister, asked, was asked his position on equal parenting and the bill we are now debating. He stated, and I quote, the best interests of the child are always paramount and should be. The member from Saskatoon, Winoskowin, will know that just two weeks ago his colleague and friend, the current Minister of Justice, appeared at Justice Committee to account for his supplementary estimates request. During the meeting, the Minister was very willing to answer questions, and I felt he was reasonable and fair in some of his responses, including the response to a question about whether the government intends to evoke the notwithstanding clause of the Charter on matters where they disagree with the Supreme Court. I posed a direct question to the Minister about Bill C-560 before the, the House today. Here's what I asked the, the, uh, the Minister at committee. Uh, Minister, our private member's bill is coming before the House uh, C-560 dealing with the Divorce Act. 
Back in 2009, your predecessor, Mr. Nicholson, indicated the best interests of the child are always paramount. Given that this question is about to come back before the House, what are your views on that, sir? He said, this particular private member's bill will receive, I'm sure, the rigorous examination that all private member's bills receive. I am familiar with the one you are referencing. I can tell you that having practiced some family law, as you have in Prince Edward Island, the long-held legal maxim and jurisprudence definitely supports that the best interest of the child will remain the primary concern. I see no change in that regard. I asked a supplementary. The bill proposes to weaken that in favor of parental rights. Do you realize that? The Minister's response, yes, I do realize that. Mr. Speaker, the Divorce Act currently establishes the best interest of the child is the paramount consideration in custody cases. In other words, the rights of the parent are subordinate to the interests of the child. This legislation seeks to weaken that. It's not acceptable to the Liberal Party of Canada. It's not acceptable to the Canadian Bar Association. It's not acceptable to the present or former Minister of Justice. And that is why we will oppose this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.